Well, do we have a population decline or a population explosion? Our next guest has been working on a documentary called Birth Gap that shows that the world's population is in drastic decline and that this is a crisis in the making. Stephen J. Shaw was scheduled to screen his movie last Friday at Cambridge when trans activists protested the movie to get it canceled. Now, the event did go ahead in a new venue in a different way. So that gives us two important things to discuss. One, why is it triggering to hear about population decline for certain activists? Uh, and two, is there even a population decline? And if so, why have we been told that overpopulation is about to destroy the planet? So Stephen, thank you so much for joining me to address these issues. Thank you, Natalie. Now, let's tackle these questions in reverse, um, because what struck me when I became aware of your movie is that I had bought into the overpopulation uh, narrative, is what we'll call it. So can you address the question of, is there in fact a population decline, and why are we told the opposite? Population trends are a little bit tricky to understand because they take decades to roll out. So if you want to look at the world's total headcount, which I really don't like doing because it's not very helpful. Yes, the total headcount is going up. We just reached 8 billion and it will go up. We know to somewhere around 10, maybe a little bit less or a little bit more. But the only reason the world's population is going up right now is that people are aging. The number of births on the planet actually reached a maximum of a 20 years ago. So if you look at babies being born total across the planet, it's already plateauing. Then if you look at specific countries, 70% of people are already living in a country with below replacement level fertility, meaning less than 2.1 children per, per woman. So um, we get mixed up and perhaps it's natural if you look at the total headcount, but what you really need to do is look at individual countries and look at individual statistics on births. One of the things that people say when you talk about population explosion is they point to Africa and say, well, they have a population explosion. So it sort of evens out as if it's a sort of conundrum. Can you address this? Um, I don't know if you want to even call it a conundrum. Well, it's simply the fact that Africa is uh, several decades behind most of the rest of the planet in terms of population trends, but the trends are identical. The number of children per woman in sub-Saharan Africa is falling by one every 15 years, which is fast. Some countries like Malawi and Ethiopia, they're falling by one child every 10 years. So I liken it to a, a roller coaster. Some countries are at the front already on the other side, like Japan, much of Europe. Some countries like US, UK and France are somewhere towards the front, but not quite there. Whereas Africa is in the kind of rear car, still on the way up, but the trends will be the same. Oh, so they are in fact heading in the same direction. There yeah. is a, okay. They um, and so one of the things that we're told is that this is bad for the planet ecologically. Now, can you address how that doesn't really work out because the wealthiest people have the highest carbon footprint? It's not necessarily just each baby then is exploding our pollution of the planet, right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, reduce or uh, trying to reduce population to help the planet is an incredibly inefficient way to try and do something if you if that's what we do want to do. You know, less people. First of all, it takes decades for that to kind of pan out. People live, what, eight decades or more? So, and during the first 30 years of a person's life, it, uh, consumption is very low. And at the end of a person's life, 65 plus, consumption is very low. But to your point, absolutely, if you look at Africa, these people in Africa are consuming a tenth or less of what we do here. So pointing fingers at Africa and using that to justify population dynamics really is a very weak argument, I find. Right. It just sort of brings to mind this idea of like poor people who have to resort to using plastic bottles and then people in the West with their like stainless steel $40 water bottles looking down at them. What you find is the reason families tend to have more children in parts of sub-Saharan Africa is that they need the children to go and walk two, three, four miles to fetch water to you know, help with crops. Once you reduce extreme poverty, you'll find birth rates fall even faster. So my concern is actually for countries who are poorer that are not preparing themselves for a future like we're seeing in you know, East Asia, Europe uh, and North America of rapidly falling birth rates. That is their destiny, it would appear, just like it has happened for us. 
You speak of this phenomenon of widespread heartbreak, sort of. You call it unplanned childlessness, uh, an entire generation that's maybe my age and a little bit older that intended to have a family and never did. This is what really got me so personally, this, I guess, um, like it, this idea that I might have waited too long or that there's an entire generation of women my age that are just living with a ghost of a baby they thought that they would have. Uh, can you explain unplanned childlessness? Yes, it was the biggest surprise to me too. Uh, when I started this project, I had no idea I would encounter these people who opened up emotionally to me, men, many women, but men too, who just revealed that they had planned to have children. And when they looked at raw data across all of these countries, there are no exceptions. We find that family structure for those who do have children really hasn't changed at all. People are having as many or as few children as mothers were 30, 40, 50 years ago. But what has exploded is childlessness. And looking at the data again, it's clear that around 80% of women had intended to have children and are left childless. And the term they use, uh, Natalie, you may have seen it, the term they use is grieving the child that they never had. And there's so many women who, first of all, um, are contributing to support groups to help other women. There's other people, though, whose emotions came out while on camera that they hadn't ever talked to anybody about this before. So it really is quite a harrowing uh, discovery that, that, that uh, so many people are in this position. You know why that hit me so hard is because I was of the generation that was given sex in the city as an empowerment movement. And you don't need men. You don't need a family. You can have a ton of fun. There's time for that later. But your data shows that there is not time for that later. And that if you hit the age of 30 without having a child, you only have a 50% chance of having one after that. And something that uh, I watched you on the Jordan Peterson show, he said, we lie to women to tell them about the most important thing in their life is not having a family. Um, I guess that's what really hit me is this sort of cultural value of you've got lots of time. And then what happens? We, and then we're not taking care of these women who ran out the clock or even men, too. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. Yeah, I'm first to say that um, the biggest single reason that people run out of time is not having a partner at the right time. Fertility is the second biggest reason. And I guess they're related. But the idea that we're going to turn 33, 35, and then we're going to meet Mr. Perfect or Miss Perfect, and we're going to date for a couple of years, uh, often that ends up in another breakup. It leaves you people kind of, well, it leaves people running out of time. Now, uh, I, I did a survey asking people what age they thought it, they would have a 50 50% chance of ever becoming a mother. The most popular answer was 40. But is it, but as you've just said, it's actually 30 years old. If you have not had a child by 30, you've only a 50, 50% chance of ever becoming a mother. One of the things we hear a lot is that we have increasing fertility rates, the highest infertility rate of any generation. And I think people sort of boil that down to environmental toxins, uh, like, you know, well, we have toxins in the diapers and toxics in the, in the cleaning products. Um, did you look into that and whether or not maybe it's environmental fertility rates? Well, those, those factors may become problems in future, but they do not explain this trend at all. This is a trend that started in Japan, Italy, Germany, Spain, around the early 1970s. And it has grown constantly across the developed world and now the developing world for 50 years. You cannot map and correlate you know, environmental issues or bile issues that go back to that time in the same way. So I'm not dismissing them as potentially being important. I don't know, but they do not explain this fall in fertility. Now, one thing demographers like to do is attribute a reason for something. You sort of give a time frame of 1974 when fertility started to drop across developed nations. But one thing you say is you can't pinpoint any one thing. Can you speak to that? What we have found is a trigger. It seems to be that economic crises cause a temporary trigger uh, that becomes permanent. The temporary trigger is people delaying um, becoming parents. Now, if you're already a parent, you're still going to have the number of children that you probably would have had before because we see no change in the rates of you know, families having two, three, four children. But we see a huge delay in people having the first child through economic crises. It then seems to be that that never reverses itself. You would expect after the oil shock or after the mortgage crisis that 
you know, childlessness would fall again, and it doesn't. So I think this is a case of societies re-engineering themselves, the new norm coming to have children are in our early 30s, mid 30s, and then finding out, wait a minute, I don't have a partner, or, you know, the fertility window is closing. Right. Now, sort of comment threads on Reddit seem to suggest that young people that just think the world is too messed up right now to have babies. Um, do you think that is a part of the narrative? It's sort of a, an extension of economic crisis is now existential crisis? I do worry that this may be a new trend that might make matters worse. It does not explain the historic trend up until now. A counter argument might be that it, it does seem to be the case that people, uh, women in particular, do get an urge to have a child somewhere in you know, late 20s into their 30s. So what younger people say now may change. But I have to say there are certain things that, you know, there, there does appear to be a certain malaise um, that, you know, gives me some concerns about how, whether rates will continue to worsen. But this trend cannot be explained, given it started in the 70s and went all the way through multiple recessions, multiple booms. And yet the fall in uh, birth rates, the rise in childlessness has been constant once triggered. Right. It may be an evolution of that, in fact. Maybe. That's interesting. Now, it would seem like the college setting is a great way to have these conversations because you are going right to the generation that can do something about it. They can either decide, hey, I buy into the idea that the world is overpopulated or, oh, maybe I'm concerned that my window to do this is lower and maybe I should challenge that narrative and think if I want a family now instead of just this idea that you're free, you're in college, don't think about it. We'll get to that later. Um, and yet the college campus is the place where this was the most hotly contested over the weekend. So can you tell me what the argument that these activists had about your movie that got it maybe not canceled, but rescheduled in a new form? Yes, I have to say I did not actually get to talk to any activists because they didn't contact me. Um, the university and newspaper also would not talk to me to explain what they had heard. So I'm hearing this second hand and third hand. The Q&A discussion that we ended up had, having, you know, one of the academics on campus was so outraged about the event being canceled. We were given private rooms to host a, a number of students. The intention was to meet for 90 minutes for a Q&A discussion. We stayed for four and a half hours. These were students who were just infuriated by not being able to listen to me and to have this deb debate amongst themselves. Um, the views that came out there I, I, I would center around perhaps there being a threat to the worldview of some people, the idea that you would link motherhood in some way to, um, you know, well, I, in, in their view, perhaps a man should not be someone who's telling women anything to do with birth rates, even though they never watched the movie, we know that, even though I don't preach anything in this documentary. I simply allow the people of the world, mainly women, to express not just opinions really, but to tell us the story of their lives. And also the, the crew, the crew that I, that I was so lucky to work with across four years, there were nine of us. I was the only man. The other eight were women, young women who were just attracted to this project because they were so interested to understand the challenges between work-life balance, et cetera, and, and becoming a mother. So the idea that any activist would want to close down that debate um, is just well, it was very surprising, very, uh, very worrying, frankly, for society today. Yes, I think so too. It, the arguments that I read just sort of splashed about without any qualification was that it's anti-feminist to tell women that they're using or not using their fertility might have some effect on their life, which is crazy. Um, and also, I don't understand why it wouldn't also be anti-masculinist, masculinist, I just made that word up, uh, because it this affects men too, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, it does. Uh, and just as much, in fact, in the documentary, you will see that come out. Um, you know, I, 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 um, I don't use the word feminist in the documentary. I've never used that word in any commentary around it. I'm simply asking people about their lives. It's for others yeah. then to take the findings of the documentary and debate around it and, you know, perhaps have a deep discussion on factors like feminism. I'm just allowing people from 24 countries to express what's going on with their life. So it's most surprising. Now, I guess 
I know that uh, I'm, I'm going to leave you with this question. And I know you don't like to participate in conjecture because I've watched you on other interviews, but maybe you can sort of uh, um, humor me. Do you think maybe there is some sort of common thread of an agenda from to stop you from publishing this, perhaps from a globalist perspective, this, you know, transhumanistic society that is like, yes, humans will stop having babies and then we replace them with bots or something. I know that's a little crazy, um, but it does bring to mind this uh, post-apocalyptic children of men future. Um, mm. Do you sort of think that any of the rumblings around stopping your work feel like that? I think I have touched upon a nerve um, perhaps from a number of communities whose worldview, whose narrative is based on an assumption, assumption, various assumptions, perhaps assumptions that the world is overpopulated, perhaps assumptions that the world is paternalistic, um, perhaps, you know, some gender based assumptions. And I think they, they may feel threatened to hear different voices and different data. Uh, I've seen people try to challenge my data, which comes from UN databases. Um, so I, I do feel more and more, or certainly after this weekend, I do have a concern that there's going to be an amplification of voices against the documentary. Um, all, all I can hope is that people give it a fair chance. And I, I'm here to talk to anyone who wants to. Talk. If anybody has a genuine criticism, contact me. I want to have a discussion. So Yeah. I mean, it really is not a political documentary at all. I've, I've watched the first part. When does the second part come out? Well, we're working on distribution options right now. We have actually a Japanese television network who's picked it up. There's going to be a cinema run in Japan. We're hoping for something similar elsewhere. So we've released part one early on YouTube because I think the subject is so important that people are aware of. I hope by this summer I'll have more information on part two and part three. Great. Well, you know, I'm sorry that this happened to you, but I am glad that it uh, raised my awareness about your project and um, certainly something I've been speaking about with my children. So I'm going to continue to follow this. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you, Natalie. Fascinating. Yeah, I, I wanted so to jump too. in. I was like trying to keep my mouth shut. But, you know, he, like people are saying like, well, hey, we went through like reviews just because in the chat says, you know, we went through 2008 collapse, COVID collapse. How can we even afford to have the amount of kids that we all wanted? Uh, but I don't think he says and I certainly didn't get this from the first part of the documentary. It's not like they're telling you to go out and have kids. Absolutely not. And also what he's trying to force you to see is that life will be a lot more expensive for all of us if we don't. And that was the point that he makes on the documentary. Um, part one is the only part that's out right now. And he makes the point about how expensive it will be for us all to care for an aging population when there is a small working population left behind. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's almost one of those things where you're like, you will pay for it. You will yeah. pay either pay for the kids you didn't have or you could pay for the kids you do have. But if there's no one coming up behind you, it becomes a lot more expensive. And a lot of people, like he says, have a lot of kids out of necessity for a workforce. Now it's sort of, it's it's less of a necessity because you don't need people to help you to get water and, and that kind of like thing. Like the farm. You know, right, the kids to on help the on the farm. Right. Uh, but there's a different need that we socially, we either have to collectively say, well, we don't want to live like this anymore. And so we reorder society to have fewer of us. That is an option, but we should make it deliberately. Or we need to say, are we prioritizing the wrong things? And I think what personally where this hits me, like I said, is that I was a part of this whole sex in the city generation where we're like, look at that. We can have pretty clothes. We don't need men. We can, you know, we don't need children. We'll be just as happy. We can have this fabulous life. Um, and then there are all of these people, my generation and above, who are grieving those choices. We should have been warned about it. We should have been honest. Uh, and we did a disservice by by just prioritizing something like not letting people choose their own priorities uh, the way this same di director was on Jordan Peterson's show. And it was fabulous. I, su I suggest you watch it. It's almost two hours long. And Jordan Peterson says we lie to people. We lie to young people and tell them their priorities are different. Like we could reorder the world. We could say to them, have a family while you can. And then you can go to college and, you know, optimize your career. We could change society if we wanted to. We just don't. Right. Um, and so these are these are collective decisions that we should make. They should not just happen upon us. And then all of a sudden your clock's ticked and it's too late um, because that's tragic. 
yeah. and expensive. There, there's many layers here that are worth thinking about. Interesting interview and also interesting first part of the documentary. I highly encourage you to go and watch it. Really, really eye-opening, jaw-dropping, in fact. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.